Good evening. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Martin, professor of English and director of the Weissman Center for Leadership. Tonight, I am so happy to welcome Amy Siskin to Mount Holyoke. Um, her lecture poses an urgent question to us, is our democracy at risk? And if you e read Amy's very important book, The List, the answer is absolutely yes. Before Amy is introduced to you, I need to thank some members of our community who made this possible. First, Joan Grenier of the Odyssey Bookstore. We're lucky to have a fantastic independent bookstore affiliated with Mount Holyoke College. Thank you to our co-sponsor for this event, the Politics Department. And as always, thank you to Media Services, especially Zach Mattis for um, making this event run so smoothly. Um, and every day I feel lucky to work with the staff at the Weissman Center, in particular, she always ducks out, is she here? My extra, oh, there she is, my extraordinary collaborator um, in this work, Janet Lansbury, who is Associate Director of the Center and Director of Leadership and Public Service at Mount Holyoke College. Um, I also wanna thank our amazing student ambassadors who represent the center and the college so very well. In preparation for this event, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Professor Jennifer Taub, who is introducing Amy Siskin tonight. So I'm gonna introduce her so she can introduce Amy. Jennifer Taub is a legal scholar, advocate, and professor of law at University of Vermont. Author of Other People's Houses, Corporate and White Collar Crime, and numerous other academic publications, she also writes and speaks regularly as a legal commentator and public intellectual. And I also want to acknowledge personally that her daily posts and interventions on her Facebook page have been sustaining and sanity inducing. <laughs> so welcome Jennifer Taub. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you to everyone who's here and everyone from Mount Holyoke College who organized this event. It's an honor to be talking about these issues in a place devoted to women's education. Um, I had the benefit when I was in middle school of going to an all-girls middle school and uh, now looking back and looking at the wonderful alumni networks both from Mount Holyoke and Smith in my own neighborhood of Northampton, I have to say one of my biggest regrets is not attending a women's college. So this is a you know quite an honor to be to be speaking at one. Um, so in some ways I'm really proud to be here, but uh, I think more than that I'm kind of sad that I'm standing here, and I can trace the reason why I'm standing here and probably why Amy herself has written this book and why we're all here to something, you know, two years ago. I remember um, back in October of 2016, the run-up to the, to the election. And you know how when you live in a household of, with parents obsessed with politics, it kind of seeps out to the kids. And my youngest daughter, Arella, was very worried. And she would often say almost every other day to me, Mama, what if Trump wins? And I worried the same thing, but I thought it was my job, kind of like my job on Facebook, to keep everybody happy and not too worried about everything. So I said, oh, it's not a problem. Don't worry. He won't. But she kept asking, and she would ask Michael, my spouse, her papa, Papa, what happens if Trump wins? So finally I sat Michael down and I said, holy shit, what if Trump wins? I mean, what are we going to do? Um, and he said, well, our institutions are strong enough. It, it, will, it will work, and right around that time, the movie, one of the Star Wars movies came out, and there was this thing, The Resistance. So I told Arella, we'll just join The Resistance. <laughs> and I didn't even know what The Resistance was, and meet, we're about to meet The Resistance right here. Um, it's amazing, women like Amy Siskind and so many others, the millions who came to the Women's March and the so many millions more who are fretting and writing postcards and calling Congress. And you know, I think everyone out there does not get enough attention for how much we are keeping um, things at bay to some degree. Um, one thing you know, folks just mentioned, or Amy just mentioned that I write this you know, daily 
post on Facebook. And the reason why I do this, and I think, and then I'm going to jump over to Amy's weekly list. The reason why I do this is because I know myself, and I'm quite obsessive. And I knew that the more, the, the more, after I cried a lot the morning after I found out he'd won, I knew that I was going to be, we're in deep trouble, having, knowing enough about this guy and his past behavior as a white collar criminal and such, that we were going to be in a lot of trouble in this country. And then I was going to be writing about it every day. And I thought if I wrote about it every day, um, people would be like, and I would think, I'm just doing the same thing over and over. It's like this kind of circling back. But I thought if I numbered it, if this was day one, and that was day two, two things would happen. It would seem like it was a new day, and it would also seem like we were making progress the way one would if they were in a prison cell marking off the days. And I counted how many days um, there were, and you know the most days that there would possibly be, I hoped, which would be until January uh, 20th of 2020, and I figured I, I could do this. Um, the other thing that kept me motivated for some friends who are here who know this, I come from a family of Republicans from the Midwest. And I remember I used to be friends with my parents on Facebook. And I love them, but they are blocked now. Because shortly after the election, my mother kept arguing with me. Um, this, was, I say this with a, a um, I'm not upset now. At the time, this was really very difficult. Um, but she would say, you're wasting your time. Now they say, oh, we saw you on CNN and your hair was in your eyes, or they gave you a lot of airtime, or we're so proud of you. They don't talk about the content. So my joke now is that I had to join the resistance because I couldn't talk to my parents on Facebook, but they have to watch me on CNN. Okay. So unlike me, who's a little bit flip about this and loose about this, Amy Siskind has been incredibly detailed and disciplined. And she faced the same challenge. I think she wanted to, if you see in the cover of her book, she was following what experts in authoritarianism advise, which is she understood the things around us were gonna change. And she was worried, I believe, based on reading her work, that we would just be like that boiling frog in the water. And then we would be boiled before we would notice it. So she was gonna document for us as we went so we wouldn't lose touch. But I think I'm pretty sure that along the way, she understood that she was writing history. Um, or her story. And I, I am so utterly grateful that she does this. I think that one day, when we're all long gone, hopefully if democracy survives, and I don't say that jokingly, we're in grave trouble now. I think that this is gonna be one of the most important guides. Um, you know, and I hope she makes another edition. This was just from the first year, but she keeps the list still. And I think that I would wanna have a copy of this. I have a copy, and I would wanna have a signed copy to pass this on to my daughter, Arella, when she's old enough to know what joining the resistance really meant, and to my grandkids. And thank you for being here and listening to Amy. I don't know if she's gonna cheer us up, but she's gonna tell us why our democracy is still at risk and what we can do about it. So welcome, Amy. So the list and what it means, it's. It still is, as Jen mentioned, going on. It's still on a website, theweeklylist.org. But why did I start doing the list? So as Jen was talking about, and we were also sure about the election prior to um, two years ago, and I had a house full of people with the H cupcakes and the champagne and everything. We all did, and it gradually went downhill. And so as somebody who runs a women's organization, I guess similar to Jen, a somewhat public voice at that point. Um, and our young women leaders especially, many of whom were texting me saying, this is the worst day of my life since 9-11, what do we do? So I was trying to figure out what I could collectively do. And um, Jewish American by background, and I was brought up you know, as a student of the Holocaust and the rise of Hitler. And from the time Trump ran, he has always struck me as being off. Um, from the time he launched his campaign where he talked about the Mexican rapists, up to the fact that he really didn't have a typical Republican or Democrat construct to what he was talking about or policies, everything was kind of fluid. And after he won, and I say it in quotes, the election, uh, that's typically, I've been alive long enough, whether you, your party won or lost, a time to unite the country and talk about policy and vision. We didn't have any of that. After he won, um, there was a spike in hate crimes. The Southern Poverty Law Center in the first week recorded 400, and I could have told you where they all were because they were all covered in the news. They were happening on college campuses, in schools, around the country. And then as we got to the first week and a half, there were 700, and I, the media couldn't keep up anymore. Uh, the media would ask Trump to condemn these attacks, and he asked for understanding. So as a sort of student of Trump, 
what I've seen of him from the time he made his Mexican rapist comment and his time asking for understanding shortly after the election, this man is the same person he was from the time he hit the campaign trail and probably for his entire life. He's not changed one bit. He's not adapted himself um, to the office, nor will he ever. He's adapting the office to him and his needs. So in addition to being a student of the Holocaust, I started to read voraciously about authoritarian regimes. And I just wanted to bring, one of the articles I read at the time, some of you might have read it, it was in the New York Review of Books, an article by Marcia Gesson that came out just as this was happening. But I, I, I included this in week 99's list in the preamble. One of the quotes from her article was, quote, there is little doubt that Trump will appoint someone who will cause the court to veer to the right. There is also the risk that it might be someone who will wreak havoc with the very culture of the high court. So you see, when I read all these articles, and I cite them all in my introduction by the experts, everything they predicted has become true. Because even though authoritarianism, as, you know, or the rise of authoritarianism is new to us in our pretty new democracy, this has happened all over the world, time and time again, and they all tend to follow a somewhat predictable path, and we are on that path. Um, so I'll, I can talk about where we are now heading into this next election, but just in terms of going back to 2016 and starting to write the list, I, you know, I, I live in Westchester County, and growing up, um, my parents were a little older, they're not with us anymore, but I grew up um, hearing all about the, the Roosevelts. And my mother's North Star was Eleanor Roosevelt, and she's my North Star as well. And I have been to her ho home, Val Kill, so many times I could give tours myself. And, you know, at, at that point after the election, you know, in addition to reading by experts, I felt like I needed to have some guidance from someone who could see beyond, uh, you know, as she had done during the Depression beyond like what was in front of us. And so I went back to Val Kill, and for those who follow me on social media, I brought Chef and Arlene with me. And I, I did the tour, which I've done so many times I could give the tour, but different things stood out to me at that time. And one was our government is we the people, um, and how important it was to empower ourselves. And Eleanor had kept, in some ways, a list. She wrote this column, My Day, Every Day. Uh, that is a historical document in its own way. And so that night, I went home and I wrote down a first list. And to give you some perspective of where we were that Saturday, that I, which is the first full week after the election, not the direct Saturday, but the first full week, um, that morning, Trump had been tweeting attacks at the cast of SNL, the New York Times, and the cast of Hamilton. So that's a trip down memory lane. Um, seems a lot different, but exactly the same. We're still doing those same exact things. And so that night I went home and there was a really odd tweet, I thought, from a New York Times reporter criticizing his own paper's coverage of Trump. Why were they talking about him um, you know, attacking by the, the cast of Hamilton as opposed to the Trump Foundation being charged for $25 million? So he was covering, he was criticizing his own paper's coverage and I snapshot it. I said, I'm gonna include this in week one. And the next morning when I went to go put it all in Medium, I noticed he had deleted his tweet. And I thought, that's strange but it lives on in week one on the weeklylist.org. And so the first week was nine items um, that were not normal, and the second week was 18 items. Um, so when people ask me, do you think it was a good idea to do the list, I point to those weeks and say that's when I thought it was a good idea to do the list. Uh, right now we're up to between typically 150 to 175 a week. Uh, but so those were the first two weeks. At week five, we were into the 20s and people started to say, oh, I, I missed five of those 25. Can you start to add links? And so around week five, the list starts to get a little more sophisticated. Um, these are all at this point on Medium and I was just, for those of you who followed me back then, cutting and pasting them and putting them on Facebook and on Twitter. And um, so starting week five again, there's links the lists start to come a little more sophisticated and consistent. And then week nine, which was the week before the inauguration um, and trip down memory lane, that was when Meryl Streep gave her Golden Globe acceptance speech and she didn't mention him by name, but she talked about the way Trump had attacked a person with disabilities and what it said with our, of our country that we would elect such a person. 
That week was the first week the list went totally viral and it had two million views. And um, that's when I knew it was time to really get serious. So uh, as he took office, the list grew to 30 to 40 items. And then as he staffed up the regime and there were many hands at work basically deconstructing our democracy, disappearing information, um, the list gradually grew to, at the end of the first year, 120 items. And around the end of the first year, um, I was waiting for the right reporter and the right outlet to write the coming out story about what I was doing. Um, and I was actually, it was June of 2017 and I was just about to leave to take my son on college tours. And um, I got an email from Margaret Sullivan at the Washington Post. And she's, I, I adore her. So this was like the, the one I was waiting for and she wanted to write about the project. And so that was the end of June of 2017. Her article came out in the Washington Post. It was the most read at the Washington Post. It's the only time in my life where I woke up and I was trending on Twitter, which is not, despite what you think, a, like a positive thing. It's scary as all hell. Uh, and anybody who wants to like take my account for a day on Twitter will realize being a public figure, you'll, it will cure you of it. But anyway, so that was the first day that the, the list really came a, a, a nationally known. And shortly after, somebody who read Margaret's article nominated it to be archived in the Library of Congress. Um, and you know, I, I, I try not to be fantastical about this stuff, but in the early weeks, things were disappearing off the website. As soon as Trump took office, an apology on the State Department to the LGBT community was wiped. Information on our environment, information on breast care, cancer. I mean, everything has been wiped. Week after week, I'm recording this kind of stuff. And people were concerned that the list would disappear. And I was concerned as well. I, I still, to this day, back it up on UBS drives. Not week one through 52, we're safe with those. But I, I still do back it up because people were concerned it would get hacked. So the idea of it being in the Library of Congress, um, you know, I thought that was great. And then people were like, well, maybe you should get it in Canada too because he might take down the Library of Congress. And it was like, funny, not funny. Um, but anyway, so it is, in, it takes a year for it to crawl into the Library of Congress, but it is the early weeks list in their very primitive form. If you followed me on Facebook or Twitter, if you go to the Library of Congress and you Google the weekly list, you can, their old, the very original versions are already showing up there and the rest are being crawled and will gradually show up. Um, so shortly after that, the woman who does the website for my organization and I decided, because I'd, I'd done some videos as well with Move On, just to build a beautiful website to put everything all in one place. So that was about a year ago now, and it was also the time of year that my organization does our on-campus runs for sexual assault, so I wanted to raise some money to do it, but we were concerned about the timing of doing both. But I said to Anelia, you know, I think a lot of people want to be part of this. And the whole idea, all along, I wanted it to be very grassroots and something that everyone could feel part of. So, um, and people have been asking about ways to donate, ways to be part. We put up a campaign to raise 15,000 with a maximum donation of $25. And in the first 24 hours, we raised $20,000 and we're like trying to stop the thing. Like we can't, you know, we don't need any more money. But it allowed us to then get a, a um, license with, for 7,000 a year with Getty Images because at this point now the, all these lists are being archived in the Library of Congress so they have properly licensed documents as opposed to a, a tweet from the New York Times reporter screenshot. So they have beautiful photos that capture. And if you get a, a chance to go to the website, theweeklylist.org, and look at the photos. We spend a lot of time each week, Anelia and I, thinking about the news that week, but what story, what picture tells the story of that week. And so some of the early pictures of um, Trump addressing the Boy Scouts or not shaking Merkel's hand or, yeah, um, you know, there, I can only pick six for my book and I really labored over which it would be, but, you know, there's a few weeks where I just, had tears coming down my eyes as I, as I was recording the list. And one of the weeks was Charlottesville, and I picked the picture from Charlottesville. And one was the week um, that Maisha Johnson was standing over her husband's <laughs> casket as it came back from Niger, and Trump was attacking her and Frederica Wilson. Uh, you know, and that was, it was just like, oh my goodness, what is happening here? And so the picture of her and her daughter in their flower dresses looking over her husband's casket as it's coming off, that, that was one as well. Um, 
And, but the pictures do tell a story, and I, I encourage you, if you have time and interest, to go back and look at the pictures from the early weeks, and it will just jog your memory. Because things happen so fast. Uh, you know, and, and that's part of what's happened is, and this was predicted by the experts in authoritarianism, that information would disappear. And so, you know, kiddingly, not kiddingly, when I first did this into a book, um, one of the experts said to me, wow, that's great that you have it in a book because unless we burn books, at least it's there. So um, information does disappear. It is now in a book. I had real reluctance about putting it in a book. One, one, I didn't really feel like I had the time to do it. And anybody who tells you, as my editor did, oh, it won't be much of a time commitment is lying to you. Um, but I, it was really, for me, it, it was the convergence of two things. One it was my fear of the information disappearing. And the second was the repeal of net neutrality about a year ago was happening. Uh, and so I was really concerned that people wouldn't even be able to see the lists on the internet, which is again, something that had been predicted. So reluctantly, somewhat, and I guess in retrospect, I'm glad I did it, but I, I, we, we bound this book and it came to market super quick last, last um, March and so this is the first 52 weeks. We're now on week 102. Um, and the, the second year would be 1,200 pages at least. So what I'm gonna do is hold off from here on in until he's gone and then do volumes because no one wants to carry around a 500 page book, let alone a 1,200 page book. This book is 400 pages and, and, and the people, the publishers and agents had been coming at me, coming at me. It was finally like the third time that the editor at Bloomsbury like was after me when somebody had already come over to me at the gym and said to me, are you Amy Siskin? And I said, yes, she's like, you need to call back my sister-in-law, who actually runs Bloomsbury in New York. So they, they, I had all these editors, and, and I just kept, was telling people, I'm not interested, I'm not interested, but it was just sort of the, the convergence of those factors and, and Bloomsbury saying to me, this is already a 400-page book. So it's a 400-page book with 100 pages of, tri of triple column footnotes. And these are, what the book captures are things that are not normal. So this isn't just a story. These are things that are atypical to our democracy. So, for example, when the Republicans were trying to repeal Obamacare, that's normal. That's something Republicans versus Democrats do. What wasn't normal is protesters who are people with disabilities being dragged out of the wheelchairs in front of McConnell's office and arrested. And those are, that's another picture in here that I chose to use. What's not normal is changing the rules of the way the Senate works, which the nuclear option, all the things that McConnell has done to take away the power of bipartisan cooperation, um, those are the kind of things that I capture in here. Disappearing information, rules and regulations being repealed, rights being taken away. Um, you know, it, it, this week's list will talk about what he's done with the transgender community, and, but one of the first things they did was go after the LGBT community, and that's in the early weeks of the list when, they, when Jeff Sessions said that sexual orientation should not be protected in the Civil Rights Act from, you know, the, I mean, they have been after this stuff throughout the list. And so what this does is sort of, in, in many ways, it's a, tra a trail guide back to normalcy um, because we have lost so much and we have normalized so much that this man could get up on stage last night and say, I'm a nationalist, you know, and, and then proceed to tell 10 other things that are factually incorrect, and our media still doesn't know how to do this two years later. They still haven't figured it out. And we can talk more about the media, but just as a general sense, they've kind of ebbed and flowed in how well they've covered him. But every weekly list, 80% of their attention goes into 20% of the stories on my list. And that means 80% of the stories, some which are super important, got almost no coverage or eyeballs. They got single source coverage, which actually led me 21 weeks ago to start to do a podcast as well. Um, I was at a, a big event in Portland, and um, that was at the time that Trump had been separating migrant families at the border, but you didn't know about it because none of the national media was covering it yet. All the stories I was putting in the weekly list were coming from um, the, the Texas area papers, the Dallas Morning News, the Houston Chronicle, um, the Texas Tribune, which I have a subscription to all of them now. Um, 
and our national media that day when I was in Portland were on their way to Singapore to give Trump Super Bowl type coverage for what any of us could tell you was going to be this big thing that tried to normalize him as a leader but came away with nothing other than elevating the status of a third-rate dictator to Trump in exchange for nothing. But our media gave him this you know, wonderful coverage and didn't cover what was happening at the border. And as I sat in a room, it was 400 people in Portland, and like, you know, people were asking about it. We decided that weekend we were all gonna be super proactive on Twitter. And that is one of the benefits of actually having a, a big following on Twitter that you can make things happen. And so that, there was tweets that we sent, one that I sent that had over 50,000 retweets. And that next week, the media did send people down to the border. And, and their governor as well, their, excuse me, their senator had been down there as well. So things were starting to move, but that helped push the media. And once the media went down there, it stopped. But that's the kind of thing that he throws them shiny coins, he drags them all to Singapore. This had been going on for five weeks and he, they hadn't been covering it or been covering it very little. So that week I decided as well to do a podcast, which is also in the Library of Congress being archived. But what I tried to do is cover these stories that aren't being covered and if you have an hour Monday morning or Tuesday morning, it will catch you up on everything that happened the week prior. It covers the list in verbal form because I, I also realize it's hard to read 170 items. So those are both happening each week. Um, so just I'll, I'll talk about a couple themes then I would love to take questions. Uh, first, Trump, like, what do I see of him? Who is he? He's the same person that he was, as I mentioned, when he first launched his campaign. He cares about two things. He cares about staying in power and making money. And if you look at everything he does um, in, in the construct of those two items, it starts to make a lot more sense. You know, there's sort of like, I, I call it a Venn diagram between his interests and the Republican Party's interests, and where they overlap is him making money. So his major achievement in the first year was the, this huge tax bill, tax cut, which has grown our deficit by 17% this year alone and is about to plummet our stock market. Um, but it gave him a big tax cut and all his friends. You know, but there is so much that is not typical of him to the Republican Party. And I, I, I sort of joke like a, a few weeks after he took office, my son got in the car after school and said, I miss Jeb Bush. Um, and I said, I miss George W. Bush, you know, days like 9-11. There's just nothing normal about this man. There's nothing dignified, there's nothing predictable, or that even if I might agree or disagree with Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush on their policies, there's nothing that really is, is typical of a Republican other than Trump needs to sort of get these people back in. We're heading into a midterms, we're not talking about the normal policy discussions we would be having on health care or tax cuts or you know any of the normal policy discussions we'd be having we're talking about a caravan you know and we're, we're stoking racism we're talking you know about things that got him into office that um, relates to 35 percent of our country that just believes our country should be back in the 1950s and we shouldn't have lgbt marriage we shouldn't have black people in the workplace, or women, or Muslim Americans should be out of this country. Um, and so that is what got him into office and what continues. That's part of his fanning the flames, and he does that throughout my book, from the transgender military ban to the NFL anthem. Anytime he's sort of off his game, he throws a shiny coin of racism, and that's part of his ploy to stay in power. He also has deconstructed our government pretty significantly. Half of our um, key roles in our federal agencies are still unstaffed, and the ones that are staffed, generally what they're doing is deconstructing the agencies they run from within. So for example, Elizabeth Warren's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, when the person who was the acting director left, they got, and this was the first example of a Trump judicial nominee, allowed Mulvaney to take over the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And what was the first thing he did? He put in a budget of zero. Um, the people that are in this regime have been remarkably efficient at deconstructing things. You know, we talk about, um, 
um, Betsy DeVos and taking away protections for students for loans, for, you know, for campus sexual assault, for what we've done for our environment. They've basically taken away all of Obama's progress on carbon monoxide emissions. Uh, but week by week, all of this stuff is captured. So that is sort of deconstructing our government from within. And so Trump has basically remodeled our government to be like the Trump Organization, which is himself in power, surrounded by 20 sycophants. And anyone who disagrees is gone. I mean, McGahn is gone, Nikki Haley is gone. He has had more turnover of high-level people than anyone in history by magnitudes. And those positions aren't necessarily being refilled because Trump thinks he's better at everything than everyone else, including, fortunately for us, the best lawyer. So um, the good news is, and we can talk about this, I don't believe he's gonna make it to 2020, but that's you know, subject to what's gonna happen two weeks from today, you know, uh, potentially. Um, so uh, those things have continued and Trump is, we're sort of on the precipice and I'll let you, prompt me in your questions about this, of, of really what's coming up in this election being so, so consequential for so many reasons. Um, what we learned in high school about history class about checks and balances, as Jen mentioned in the intro, I think what the takeaway from this is, those are norms, not laws. And um, I think the outcome when we get to the other side will be a lot more things like what's happening in Rhode Island where their state assembly passed a law that in order to be on their ballot for president, you have to release five years of tax returns. So I think we'll start to codify things that in the past were just expectations, and Trump has done none of these expectations. But as time goes on, we've stopped asking for his tax, tax return. We stopped asking for his medical. He still hasn't had a formal medical evaluation from somebody that we can trust. Um, but these things kind of build up, you know, like remember when he first took office and how outraged we were that he was going to benefit from his properties. Our whole foreign policy now is predicated on where Trump wants to do business. The most recent example, Saudi Arabia, but starting with the Muslim ban, which, you know, he tried three times and that was the court standing up to him. Finally, he threw in a couple of countries that weren't Muslim countries like Venezuela and North Korea, because you can just see them lining up in the airport in North Korea to come here. Um, and then he got it through the Supreme Court. Um, and, and so that's the importance of these court system and what he's doing and how they've restacked the judicial branch, which up until now has been the only balance on him. But if you look at the countries in our Muslim ban, guess who's not in it? Any of the countries that have actually carried out terrorist attacks against the United States. The Muslim countries that are in our Muslim ban, I don't care what he calls the travel ban, our Muslim ban, are all countries where Trump doesn't have financial dealings. None of the countries in the Muslim ban have attacked the United States or had their sovereigns attack the United States. So that's just an example, and there are many, of how our foreign policy is dictated by where Trump and his family want to do business. And um, we can talk more about that as well. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just talk briefly about our media, and then we can take questions. Um, and this is a complicated question, a complicated question about like how is the media doing? Um, right now, not so good. I mean, there's been periods of time where I think they've done better. I think initially they were caught flat-footed. But something interesting happened as I, was, as I was starting to record things. Reuters and international press, Reuters very specifically, their editor-in-chief said, once Trump took office, we're gonna cover him as an authoritarian regime. And the foreign media has been vastly more effective than the US media. Um, if you look at my book, and you look at, or if you look at the weekly lists or follow what I do, the people that really get it and are covering it are Reuters, The Guardian, McClatchy, Toronto Star. Um, they have been able to distance themselves and they have some understanding of authoritarian regimes because they cover things on a global basis that our media just does not appreciate. And there's been times our media has gotten better, but right now they're doing a really bad job. Um, I mean, they've allowed Trump to take this caravan story, perpetuate lies, and instead of staying in the, like last night, the Toronto Star said, false, 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 false. Instead of doing that, they report these things. And then they're out in the public domain for consideration that there are Middle Easterners in the caravan and, and you know, MS-13. Yeah. By repeating these things, and this thing about the middle tax, middle, middle uh, class tax cut when Congress is out of session. Our media doesn't know yet how to cover him as an authoritarian, which is 
unfortunate because one of his main goals is to silence them and to threaten them. And if you think about what's happened in the short period of time, last week's list had two examples, um, you know, the sort of the, how, how Jamal Khashoggi, how we've not condemned that, whereas all the other democracies, I guess we're sort of in many ways the former democracies, have publicly condemned it, but Trump has business interests and he has supposed to jobs with this contract, which literally last week went from 50,000 jobs to 450,000 jobs to 600,000 jobs by Saturday for a non-existent contract. But our media just keeps reporting this stuff as, oh, he says 450,000 jobs. Um, you know, that and we look at examples of him talking about the the media being the enemy of the people, the shooting at the Capitol Gazette, the potential shooting at the Boston Globe, if not for the FBI intervening. Um, our media is in danger, physical danger, danger of being disbelieved. And that's part of what the hallmark of authoritarianism is to deconstruct the media and our institutions, which, you know, going back to what we started with, Marsha Gessen's quote about the Supreme Court I think we've all lost some trust in the Supreme Court based on what's happened here and the politicization of the Supreme Court, as well as what the damage Trump has done to the FBI, the Department of Justice, and so on. But when all those things don't look trustworthy, then the strong man takes power. So we are two years down the road, you know, in a very difficult situation headed into these midterms. So. Uh, so Thank you so much, Amy Siskin, for joining.